welcome to the Board Game Network. This is James. Uh, we are going to have a special treat for us today. We are going to be able to hear Joel Toppin, the designer of Comancheria, talk about his game Comancheria and the development and some of the, the behind the scenes things that went into it and talk, discuss the cards and stuff. So let's just get right into his video. Hey everybody, this is Joel Toppin here and James over at the Board Game Network asked if I would shoot a video for him and uh, maybe kind of take a look at some of the strategic decisions that players are going to be confronted with at the beginning of the first period of Comancheria. Uh, as you may know, I am the designer of Comancheria, so I do have uh, some insight into how the game works and uh, how to play it successfully, but um, I'm a little reluctant to, to share strategy tips with my own game design because part of the enjoyment that I receive as a designer is watching uh, players uh, come up with strategies that I haven't even thought of. It never occurred to me and uh, be able to take and press the game system to the limits and uh, you know try to break the game even. Uh, that that's some of the enjoyment that I get is watching players identify how to play the game well and quite often uh, players will end up playing much better than the designer does and so I am a little reluctant for that reason to share my insights because my insights may not be the best insights but I also realize that new players uh, may find the challenge to be somewhat daunting so let me walk you through the situation and I'm using Vassal here for this video hope you don't mind I just don't happen to have a video studio and uh, so we're just gonna use this if you look at the video or uh, on the uh, if you look at the uh, history card here for the first period you will look at the victory check objectives and I'll zoom in real tight on that this is really what the player has to look at right off the get-go. Players must control Upper Arkansas and have a rancheria in a second territory. Uh, and so you have a limited amount of time in which to achieve this particular goal. And look up in the, in the rule book, make sure you understand what control is. And uh, I get a lot of questions on Board Game Geek, and we're happy to answer those questions there. There's also an FAQ that can help you uh, find you know, answers to questions you may have or encounter in your first game plays. Uh, but one of the things that players seem to be prone to forget is that the Palo Duro Canyon space does not belong to any territory. So make sure you understand the control rules in the game. Having a rancheria in here generally gives it an element of protection, certainly from the colonial enemies uh, that'll come out of the square spaces here. Uh, but it does not protect you from raids that come from the tribal spaces. So do, do be aware of that. Uh, control is when you have uh, one of your game pieces, like a rancheria. When you have a rancheria in a round map space and there's no tribe or settlement in uh, any of the map spaces belonging to that territory. The territories are color-coded, but they're also printed inside the round uh, circle, as you see right here, Upper Arkansas and then you'll see this is Lano Estacado, and so forth. There are six round spaces to every territory, and that, that can kind of help you as well to identify what spaces constitute a territory. So at the beginning of the game, these two tribes are basically blocking Comanche control of the Upper Arkansas. And so the player is going to be right off the bat is going to be confronted with this this challenge and you do operate from a position of strength you have the initiative the enemy is going to be responding to you that's important to understand the enemy will respond to you you don't have to react to them at the beginning of the game so the 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 logical choice that a lot of players will go with is to go after and try to kill these two tribes right off the bat but that's not necessarily uh, the best opening move, uh, I tend to go that route. However, I want to show you all of the options. So let's look at some other options here for the opening. First, let's consider what we got here. We have three uh, two-strength bands that begin in Rancheria A. We have enough horses for all of them. We have, actually have four horses. Uh, we have a Mahimiana. And our Mahimiana and our Pribo have a medicine rating of two. Now that means that one of these three bands can uh, is going to be left behind if we do a take actions operation because there are not 
enough spaces to activate the third band. That's something uh, important to remember. So we do have a position of strength here. Let's look at a couple of options. The, the most obvious option to look at for our first move is to do what I show in the tutorial in the, in the rulebook, is just send out bands, hunt some bison, uh, and, and then go and, and launch raids on either of these two uh, tribes here. Now, if you're going to do that, this is the tribe that you want to kill first and foremost because it sits at a, at a junction point that's going to give you access to the south. Uh, and if you play the game enough, players that watch me play will notice that I try to get a band, I try to get a rancheria down here into the Lano Estacado or even into the Brazos, Colorado, down here far enough south that they can start hitting the, uh, the, the southern settlements that begin to crop up down here. Plus you have lots of bison, so one of the targets I'll try to do is get somebody down into here or here or here very, very early, as early as I possibly can. Now, the reason I bring that up is because another opening uh, possibility, if you don't want to, to be aggressive right out of the gate, would be to use one band to go and hunt some bison here, uh, and then send another band with some horses and just march them down to one of these spaces and park them. Uh, you may even park them in the Palo Duro Canyon here. Uh, doing so would, uh, you know, allow you them to be somewhat safe. You're somewhat safe from, from hostile raids. You're definitely safe from, from colonial war columns in, in this space. And just keep them there until you do a passage of time and you can create that second rancheria. As soon as you get a second rancheria up, your position becomes much stronger. Uh, the reason for that is, you know, if if you lose your la your only rancheria, it's going to be game over. You, you will lose the game. So getting a second rancheria up, that's that's big. You've increased your staying power a hundred percent. So that's something that I make as a priority. I'm not even terribly worried about killing these two guys right off the bat. I do like to kill this one because in doing so, uh, it opened up you know, areas so that I can move my rancheria eventually past that and get it south. I love, I love to park a rancheria right there, uh, but I can't do that when there's a tribe. Of course, my bands can pass through there, so it's not, it's not going to block me from sending bands out right away. So if you're going to do take actions right off the bat, that's something to think about. You can either go and do like we do in the tutorial and clobber one or both of these guys, or you can start right away planning for your first rancheria. Um, another option that you have to start the game off, you have three operations that you could potentially do. You cannot do passage of time because of the positioning here of the passage of time, um, uh, the operations marker here. When it's in an un unnumbered space, you can't do passage of time. So right off the bat, you're not going to be able to do that. Uh, let me go ahead and take just a second because in my setup, I did not put this over here. So let me go ahead and do that. Okay. The other two operations that you could do right off the bat before you do anything else is you could do a culture action. Uh, there's very little risk to doing a culture action. The only thing that's going to really happen is you're going to gain one culture point because you have a rancheria in this territory, but you're, that's all you're going to get from that because you don't control the territory owing to these two tribes. Uh, you will not get the bonus plus one culture point out of that. But right off the bat, you could up your culture by one, and the only negative thing that will happen to you is the operations counter does move down the track, which does put you closer to having to test to see if you're forced into doing passage of time. And during the operation cleanup, you will draw a uh, one of the success check counters out of the cup, like you see here in Vassal. You'll pull one of these guys out. But remember, you haven't done anything yet, so the chances of pulling a success are very high. And so there's there's minimal risk of activating an enemy right off the bat with that. So that is a lo the lowest risk alternative to starting the game with uh, an operation other than... Uh, uh, take actions is to do a culture action. The third action that you could start the game with, or third operation you could start the game with, it would be a planning operation. 
Now, this does embody some risk, but there is some, uh, some reasons why you would want to do that. Uh, let me show you a couple of them. First of all, if you do a planning operation, and let me zoom in so you can see this a little bit better, but if you do a planning operation, notice that your bands are in an unfinished state. That's, that's a good time to do a planning operation because they're not going to suffer attrition. Nothing bad's going to happen to them. The downside is that you only get one, uh, you only have one paribo to do in a headman action with. And that's really the key reason for doing a planning operation is to be able to, to get those access to those powerful headman actions. If you choose to roll the dice, and you roll a one, you roll a two. Now, there's only a one in six chance of you pulling that off. But if you were to do that, right off the bat, you choose planning, then you get your headman actions, and you choose to roll the dice, and you roll a two. You could get two headman actions out of that. But that's a really risky thing, uh, way to start the game. That's very, very risky. Uh, if you end up with zero headman actions, then you've pretty much taken a planning op action for or planning operation for nothing. So I would just take, if I started the game with planning, I wouldn't risk the die roll. I would take my guaranteed headman action, and then I have some other choices of what I could do with it. One of which would be to spend my only action point that I start the game with. You'll notice over here on the track, we have one action point, one AP. I could spend that as my headman action and immediately take the Ute Alliance card into my hand, and now I have a couple more choices later on I can do that. I could play it to put a three strength band into any map space. That opens up all kinds of possibilities. And a lot of players forget about the top part of this card. That's actually very useful. It might even be more useful than rolling the dice and hoping to kill a tribe or settlement right off the bat. So consider this. Guaranteed a three strength band that could start off your second rancheria really, really well. And because you can put it into any map space, boom, I could play that card and plop him down in Palo Duro Canyon. Uh, and then when I do Passage of Time later on, I'm going to get a good Paribo out of that because I have a strong band. The band's not going to be finished, so he's not going to, you know, a trid or anything like that. We, we have a really strong position there. So that's something else to think about. Uh, that would be a very good card. And then the, you also have the, the added capability of that card having a 66% chance of killing one of these tribes right off the bat. And then you only have one enemy to deal with. So opening the game with planning provides you some with some really cool options. Now, I said it's the most risky uh, opening to the game. Let me show you why. The reason why it's terribly risky is, let's look at the enemy instruction display over here. As a part of any planning operation, you the enemy will get a free uh, a free uh, instruction to execute. And so you're going to roll the dice on this table, and there is a 33% chance that the north will be selected. If the west or south is selected, that's water off a duck's back. It's not going to be a big deal. The south is going to put a settlement, that, and that's pretty benign right off the bat, but you, you want to be aware about letting those get out of control, okay? Settlements, as they start to stack up, they are going to become a real problem. Uh, just be really careful about it. It's the same thing as in Navajo Wars. Settlements are bad, okay? So it, it doesn't do anything to you right away, but uh, later on they will come back to haunt you. The East is not going to activate at all in the first period, so we don't even have to worry about that column. The West column is got a subjugate marker up at the top, uh, it could flip over, you know, to a war, but neither of those is going to hurt you, and that is because of the prevailing conditions of the War of Spanish Succession that begins the game in play. So, think about that. You know, if that's in play, then, you know, if the enemy gets to execute one of these, nothing's going to happen there, but it is going to park the culture attack that much closer to you. So, you're, you, you're that one step closer to being dinged on your culture points. The biggest threat would be that you roll a 1 or a 2 and that this topmost instruction does not flip over to encroachment, but rather stays as a raid. And now you're going to have an enemy raid 
and it's going to be parked right here. And chances are you're going to lose a military point because they are going to get at some point to your rancheria. He's within two spaces. The odds are he's going to get there before you can do something about it. And so you're going to have to confront that. And the cost of doing business is you're going to lose a military point because they got to your rancheria. So that's that's the the worst case scenario uh, would be that 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 raid plops down in one of those two places and then bad things progress from there. Now you will probably defeat that raid because raids are pretty easy to defeat. Two strength and you've got two strength bands in here plus a horse. Uh, you're probably going to take care of business and defeat that. So it's not that they're going to wipe out your rancheria. It's that they're going to hit you and they're going to hit you right out of the gate. So those are your those are your opening options in the game right off the bat. First decisions you have to make. Now let me zoom back out a little bit here and let's look at another opening decision that the player has to make, and that is this: which of these cultural development cards, which of these first these culture cards, are you going to start the game with? I don't recommend you start with Diplomacy. That's one you want to pick up later because it does open the door to some powerful level 2 and level 3 cards. But level 1 doesn't do anything for you, and I'd prefer to start the game with something that, that provides me with some benefit. Typically, I will start with Horsemanship. Here's why. It gives me a plus 1 battle die roll modifier for bands in possession of a horse's counter. That's my main reason. I'm going to face battles in the game. I'm going to almost always have horses. This gives me that much more of an edge in battle, and I think that that's worth a worthwhile way to start the game. That's not the best decision necessarily, however. Let me show you some other options. Another really good opening option that I have started with and had success with is to open with spirituality. Why? When determining the medicine rating of a new headman, roll two dice and apply the highest roll. That is a really, really useful capability. It's one of my favorite culture cards to use. Right off the bat, I told you, one of my strategies is to get a second rancheria into play. And right off the bat, if I have this thing, I'm, I'm going to have uh, you know a two die roll to to determine the quality of my new headman and so chances are I can roll a 6 on one of those two dice and then my new headman will have a di will have a medicine rating of 3 right off the bat that's really useful so that's that's another one that I I'm I'm very favorably disposed to starting a game with that Let's look at Lords of the Plains. During step 2 of the war column phase a lone band in the same space as a war column may attempt to evade that's useful, but it's probably not something I'm going to need right out of the gate. That having said that, it opens the door to a very, very, very useful level 2 card. In fact, I will buy this card simply to get to the level 2 card later on in the game because this event, this action capability here is tremendously useful in dealing with large enemy war columns. So you can whittle them down, wipe them out before they can get to your rancheria. That's going to save you a lot of military points down the road. Uh, the last one on here is very powerful as well. Um, allows your rancherias to evade. Uh, especially if they have a, a, a low band strength in them. that You have a smaller group of people that are trying to evade. It can make your, your little rancherias very, very slippery. And that can save you a lot of military points down the road. But right out of the gate, this is probably, I would not advise that you start the game with Lords of the Plains Level 1. Let's look at politics. During Step 7 of planning operation, the player may move one allied tribe to an adjacent space, not across dash lines, within stacking limits, remove any bison from the destination space. It allows me, basically what this does is it allows me the ability to... You know, if I have an allied tribe and I'm going to get them, it allows me to move them around. It's not necessarily the most, it, it has no benefit right off the bat. I have to wait until I have an allied tribe and then I have to wait until planning to use it. But it does open the door to level two, which is a useful headman action. I can remove one allied tribe to stock, 
return the allied instruction to the bottommost empty space of its column and replace these with one available two string band basically alliances are all, are always temporary in the game and what this card does is allows me as a headman action to basically remove a tribe from play and convert them into bands into a band if you will that's pretty useful but right out of the gate the politics card uh, I don't recommend you start the game with it tactics Placement of a fourth Ravage counter on a tribe or settlement immediately removes that tribe or settlement from play. Return the Ravage counters to stock. Now, this is a good one to start the game with. However, let me point out to you that the Apache War is pretty much doing the same thing temporarily, and it only requires three Ravage uh, counters to achieve the same effect. But basically what this would do is this card is going to go away. Uh, as soon as you do your first passage of time, this is gone. Uh, this will stay with you the rest of the game. There's not an immediate benefit, but it will kick in sooner than you realize. And it's one of those things that it doesn't look like the best way to start. And it's easy to forget, oh, I need that later on. It also does open the door to a very useful scout action, which allows you to take a peekaboo at cards. Um, that's your level 2 tactics card. Level 3 tactics card is really useful later in the game when the Santa Fe Trail gets active. So starting the game with the tactics level 1, I still think horsemanship is a better choice, but this is still a very valid choice to take. Trade. Let's look at this one. Trade level 1 is another one. Right up there with spirituality, I have started the game with this. What this does is during a trade action, the player may acquire guns in trade with a tribe and or the east enemy space or peace space. So what this means is I'll never be able to get guns from here or here. Spanish and Mexicans were pretty good at arms control and keeping trying to keep them out of the hands of, of the native tribes. However, the French over here, they trade guns to anybody and tribes would get them, tribes in contact with the French would get them, and so what this, what that particular card represents is just that. These tribes here are getting guns from the French over here and here, the square space. Um, the French are not an enemy in the game. They're basically an abstraction at this point. But basically all these tribes, these gray hexagonal tribes, they eventually acquire guns from these guys, and that card would allow me to go and trade with these fellows and acquire guns, and guns are good in the game. Right off the bat, I can go ahead and launch some raids here, get some captives, then I go over here, trade those captives in, get guns, and I can start really wrecking havoc. That's, that is a really, really useful opening. So, it's right up there with spirituality and uh, horsemanship. So, in fact, this one here, I think, is every bit as useful as horsemanship right off the bat. It does open the door to the level two card, trade fairs. At the beginning of every, of a planning operation, each rancheria, the, uh, in each rancheria, the player may spend one bison, horses, or captives in order to take one trade goods counter from stock. That's really useful. I mean, Boom! You get some re-rolls. You get some redraws with those things at the beginning of every uh, planning operation. That's that's a cool effect. So and and level one just opens the door right up to that. Last one. Let me zoom in one more so the auto zoom will stop kicking in. Uh, let's look at warfare level one because this is another very valid opening card uh, during a take out. Basically, this starts with a new action for you. So during take actions, you can do Warpath, which is like a raid with the exception of the uh, Warpath action place it has a tendency to place more Ravaged counters on the target. A raid with, is only going to put one Ravaged counter there regardless of the number of successes you draw. But you, at the same time, you collect, you know, horses or captives. You get spoils from that. With Warpath, you're not to collect spoils. That's not what this is about. This is about just this is just about killing. So when you when you use this particular action, your goal is to go out and kill stuff. 
So you're not going to get any horses. You're not going to get any captives from this. What you're going to do is you're going to place typically more than one Ravage counter down. Now where this works well right out of the gate is it's going to intersect with the Apache War where when you put three or more Ravage counters on a tribe, that tribe gets removed from play. So boom, you could go and clobber this guy and kill him and you haven't even needed to buy this card to kill something very quickly. So the faster you can deal with these two guys, the faster you can start establishing your position as the dominant power in this region. So opening events, opening culture cards. Let's look at the uh, the final analysis. These would be the ones that I would choose between. I would choose between these four, okay? The uh, the tactics level one, I'm going to put that, that's probably not something I will start with, but it's one I'm going to want to pick up eventually uh, and sooner rather than later because its effect is very useful. But this is probably what I'm going to choose. I tend to gravitate toward horsemanship because I like that edge in battle, but I'll tell you what, having trade and being able to get guns that might equal the ability of this card, and it opens the door to a much more capable level 2 card. The level 2 horsemanship card is okay, but I like this one better. So, I'm going to say in order of preference and power, you, you really have to think about what kind of strategy you're going to use. But one of these four cards, Spirituality, um, I would say is slightly less capable than these three, but these three would be my preferred opening. Either Horsemanship, Warfare, or Trade as my opening culture card. So that's that's just my first video, some analysis of Comancheria. Okay, so one of the questions that uh, I was asked to deal with at some point in the video is, how did I come up with the idea for the game? Okay, those of you who have never played Navajo Wars, uh, I, I put this into the designer notes in that uh, the game came about as a result of reading the book by Hampton Sides entitled Blood and Thunder. And as I was reading that book, I began to see the potential for a game, a solitaire game, that could look at life from the native point of view and give people a glimpse of history from a unique vantage point. Most books do not tell the story from the native point of view, uh, or, or even from an objective point of view for that matter. A lot of times there, there's bias in these narratives. Uh, most of them tend to be pro-colonial uh, powers, white, pro-white, pro-soldiers, um, and, and th that tends to be true of the older narratives, especially the contemporary accounts. So when I was reading Hampton Side's book, which is really a story, it's really two stories. It's a story of Kit Carson's life, and it's a story of the Navajo and how they intersected with one another. But it was in reading that book that I saw potential for a game, and I began to work on it. As I was researching the game, because Hampton Side's book, you know, got me into some other books that were, were kind of guiding my design, design decisions for Navajo Wars, and I found myself reading more and more and more about the Comanche, and I found myself fascinated about how different they were from the Navajo. At the same time, I did experience some resistance in getting my first game published because the topic is so off the beaten path that there was question, would anybody buy this? And the fact that it sold out within a year, I think, answers that question. But it, you know, in all fairness, this isn't the Battle of the Bulge. It's not Stalingrad. So who's going to buy this game? It was a valid question for any publisher. So I don't blame them for being, you know, very cautious in terms of that. So as I'm working through that, one of the objectives, or one of the, I should say, how do I put this? One of the, the things I wanted to do, I wanted to tell the story from the native point of view, but I also wanted to design a game that was unlike anything out there. And so I'm pitching this thing to the publisher, and one of the objections that they had to it, that, that some play, I shouldn't say the publisher, but some one of the objections that some of the playtesters had to it was, well, this isn't really much of a war game. You spent a lot of your effort trying to avoid combat in Navajo Wars. And that was, that was, you know, true to the history as I understood it. So when I come 
you know, come time to design a follow-on game, Navajo Wars gets published and it's successful, but, you know, some people are like, hey, it's, it seems to be more of a Euro game. It's not really a war game, but it's not really a Euro game either. It's kind of a war game, but not really. That's kind of what I'm dealing with. And so Comancheria is something that I wanted to take next because I knew that any design uh, involving the Comanche would, would have to be very warlike. So that's how I came up with the idea for Comancheria. I wanted to design something that, that felt like Navajo Wars in a way, uh, it, that had resource management in it, that felt similar but was much more of a war game. So people that like the, the conflict aspect, like the idea of conquering, uh, would be able to enjoy it. So that's, that's how I came up with the designs of Navajo Wars and Comancheria. One of the questions that I'm also asked uh, is, how did I establish play balance? Let me say this. Play balance for a solitaire game, when you're, you're designing a solitaire game, Establishing play balance is the hardest part of the design. One of the misconceptions I had when I began to design Navajo Wars is I thought that it would be easier to, for my first design to be a solitaire game because I wouldn't have to find you know opponents to help me play test it locally before I could even pitch it to a designer. You know I could I could play test a solitaire game no problem. But what I found quickly was just you know getting the play balance right to where it's challenging but it's not impossible and it doesn't feel the victory goals don't feel arbitrary and you know some some solitaire games you feel like you're you're in a curve that you can't there's a certain point at which you 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 just can't win uh, there's some levels of difficulty that are just impossible right off the bat and you can try it but it's just you know why spend the time it doesn't really tell a story. There's just a lot of, you know, dice chucking and chart checking. Um, and I didn't want to design a game like that. I wanted to design a game that told a story that felt realistic, felt possible, uh, but was difficult. It was challenging. And even if you lost, you could look back and say, man, that was fun. I, that, was a, that was a neat story that the game told. So how did I achieve the, the play balance? Well... In some ways, I don't know if I ever have achieved play balance. Um, I got it as good as I knew how to get it, but I think that there's always room for improvement, for tweaking. And so a lot of what I'm looking at with, with Comancheria is I'm trying to see now if the play balance holds up to massive, extensive playing by the public. Um, there were some play testers that complained the game was too easy, but I, I suspect they may have been playing something incorrectly because I have lost far more times than I've won. Uh, another question I was asked to answer is, uh, have I ever beaten the game? Yes, I have beaten the game. I've played the entire campaign. I have won. I've only done it a couple times. It is very difficult to do, and it should be difficult to do. If I'm trying to tell a story uh, where, you know, if the player wins, you have gone into alternate history because historically the Comanche did not win. Um, so it should be very difficult, but it should be achievable too. And I believe that I, I believe I have struck that balance and as a player I have done it. It does require some luck, but it requires an awful lot of skill in navigating the various threats that come against you, allocating your resources properly, not wasting opportunities when they present themselves. Uh, there's a lot that goes into winning the whole campaign. So, yes, I have won the game, but I have lost far more times than I have won. Another question is how how does uh, how does the difficulty ratchet up as you play? How's the play experience change from period to period? The the flavor of the game is going to change in each period. Periods one and two are very similar. Uh, in period two, the player is probably going to be in a much stronger position. If if the player is playing well, the player should have three rancherias in play going into that third period. If you can do that, you're going to be sitting in a pretty powerful position. Now let me say something about the rancherias. There, you can have up to five rancherias in the game. Originally the design allowed for six, but here's what I found. 
I found that if you have only one rancheria, you're very vulnerable. If you have too many rancherias, you can end up with more than you can handle. The problem is you can only activate one rancheria at a time, and you're not normally going to have enough action points to activate bands from the rancheria that you didn't activate. So I find that the, the really happy medium for me is to have three or four rancherias in play. If I have five rancherias in play, the danger becomes that one of them is going to get weak and will not be able to withstand attack, and it's going to become a liability at some point, and that's going to hurt me. So that's that's something else. That's a little secret that I guess I'm spilling here. Um, I kind of wanted players to figure that one out on their own, but I'll, I'll throw that one out there. Um, there's something of a bell curve in terms of having these rancherias in play. And so, anyways, I digress from the original question. How do the periods feel different? Periods 1 and 2 will be very similar. You're going to be conquering. Uh, the South will be far more active in the second period than in the first period. And the West will be less active than in the first period. Uh, but the tribal activity will be about the same. But the tribes are going to be weakening. Uh, disease and epidemics are going to be killing these things off. That's another thing to think about. Don't kill off all the tribes. You're going to need some allies. So be careful and be thoughtful of what tribes you conquer and what tribes you allow to remain as a buffer between the colonial powers and you and also as a trading partner, especially if you have trade goods and need guns. So be very, very careful. Some players make the mistake of going out and just relentlessly killing tribes and then they wake up and one day and realize that they have no allies in the region. So be very careful about that one too, guys. Okay, strategy is, is going to be different from period to period. If I'm playing just the first period, I tried to design the game so that it would encourage the player to adopt the same tactics that they would if they're playing just period one versus if they're playing periods one and two or the full campaign. I tried to achieve that. I think that there, if you're only playing like periods one and two, I mean, if you wanted to, you could stop at any point, really, guys. Uh, if you just wanted to say, I want to just play periods one and two, you could just use, you know, the, the victory check objectives on, on those both, both those cards and, and, uh, determine whether or not you won or lost the game. Um, I tried to design it so that you wouldn't ad adopt, if you're just playing a couple periods, you wouldn't adopt a strategy that was, that was gamey, that, um, that you wouldn't do if you were doing the campaign. I would say that that holds pretty true. Um, if you're playing just period one, however, I've seen some pretty hokey stuff to try to get, you know, the victory check objective and, and end the, end the period as fast as you can, you know, do some passage of times and, and let's get done with the period. Even using spend, uh, spending trade goods to re-roll my dice, uh, you know, so that I have to, uh, do a victory check and that would end the, the game and I would be in a winning position. I've seen that done and that's perfectly valid and that's the trade-off that you get when you play just one period. Um, but for the most part, I think the victory goals do encourage the player to play each period as though they're playing the full campaign. How does Comancheria play, uh, differ from Navajo Wars? That, that's like such a huge question. I could spend an hour talking about that. They are completely different games. Um, they have similarity only in feel, but they are vastly different games. Um, I'll, I'll share one thing that's very different that I don't know if I've shared in other videos or interviews, and that is the map. This is a literal point-to-point -point map. The point-to-point -point map with Navajo Wars is not, it, it really isn't a point-to-point -point map. It looks like one because the stones are all linked to one another, but it's not a point-to-point -point map. It's an area map. There are, there are six areas, and those areas um, are almost like a, uh, like a target like there's there's one territory that's adjacent to another territory that's adjacent to another territory and another they form a circle Canyon de is kind of in the middle uh it's almost like like a little bullseye type type of a configuration now the point to point aspect of it is not literal locations it's actually a measurement of terrain difficulty so area number 1 means light open open areas very easy to traverse level 2 or area two is a little bit tougher terrain, 
a little bit tougher to traverse. But in order to get from this territory to this territory, I have to pass through maybe some light terrain, then some rugged terrain, and then maybe some mountains and some canyons and then some really rough terrain, and then I can get into another open area. That's what's going on with the Navajo War map. I believe I talk about that in the designer notes for that game, uh, but that's something that if you're just looking at it on Board Game Geek and you know nothing about Navajo Wars, that's something that'll jump out as very different. The second thing I think that's really different about it is I look much more at the population of the people. In this game, all you have is warriors in, a, in, in warrior bands of three different strengths, and then you have your headmen. In Navajo Wars, you have men, women, and children, and they all have a, a unique function that's important to them. Then you have a fourth category of population, that is your elders, and they work like your Mahimianas and your Pribos in this game. Uh, they're similar, not entirely the same, but they are similar. Your elders are hugely important in Navajo Wars, and so are your men, so are your women, and so are the children, and you have to balance them and manage them properly to win the game. So that's that's a core difference uh, between the two games, would be in the way the map works, but but the whole game, both of the games are completely different from one another. But those are some notable differences that maybe I haven't talked about before. Uh, whatever games have I developed uh, that have been released... Um, First game I developed was with Craig Besink, uh, Hellings by GMT Games on the Peloponnesian War. I also developed, I started to develop his other game, uh, Triumph and Tragedy, but the fact of the matter was I just didn't have enough time to develop his game and commit the time to designing Comancheria, so I handed that project off, and I think they went through a couple other developers before it, it got uh, published. But uh, Craig was a great guy to work with. I worked with Mark Herman on Washington's War. I worked with uh, Ted Reiser on Storming the Reich for Compass Games. I did, uh, let's see, I worked with Volko Runke on a couple of projects. He's He was a great guy to work with, too. Um, I worked with him on Labyrinth. I also worked with Trevor Bender on Labyrinth the Awakening. I developed both of those. Uh, developed the first coin game, uh, Andean Abyss. And then I kind of got out of developing games for, for coin because I, they were coming out so fast. And again, I was working in Comancheria. I didn't have the time to devote to being a developer. And so the last game I developed was Trevor's expansion, uh, Labyrinth the Awakening for, uh, Labyrinth. And, uh, I, I haven't been involved in development since. I, I have a pretty busy life and, and pretty much, uh, don't have time for for that like I used to. So those are the other projects that I've I've worked on. I had I don't have any other games published besides Navajo Wars and Comancheria. I am working on game number three in my First Nation series, and I'm deeply involved in it right now. The research is done. The game engine is under construction. It is going to be a vastly different game experience from Navajo Wars and Comancheria. The game's title is going to be Red Clouds War. And it's on the 1866-1867 uh, campaign in nor what is now northern Wyoming on the Bozeman Trail. And uh, so that is going to be game number three. It's going to be a much more tactical game, much more... Uh, the, the scale is going to be operational uh, with individual you know, people, um, notable headmen, notable officers for the U.S. Army. Uh, basically, it's the eight, it's the second battalion of the 18th Regiment of Infantry, and a few companies of the Second Cavalry against a couple thousand, uh, a coalition of a couple thousand or more uh, Lakota, and Northern Cheyenne, and Arapaho that had uh, come together to defend the hunting grounds in the Powder River country. And uh, so that's it's going to be a different game because it's not taken from an upper level strategic grand scope view like Comancheria and Navajo Wars. This is only covering a 13-month period. Uh, my goal is to make the game, you know, something that's reasonably fast playing, uh, something that's got a lot of depth to it. I would like it to have uh, two-player capability. Um, that's something else that Navajo Wars has that Comancheria doesn't. It does, Navajo Wars has a uh, uh, semi-cooperative uh, variant where you can play semi-co-op one player can win, but both players can lose. So um, 
that's kind of a neat little addition in Navajo Wars that we didn't come up with for Comancheria. But Red Clouds War is, uh, I want it to have a two-player capability. And it's a very balanced contest, really interesting stuff. Um, biggest design challenge I'm bumping into there is how do you model, uh, how do you model this conflict at this scale, make it really engaging and, and just demonstrate the, how tense it was. It, it could go either way. It's a very, very balanced situation. And so achieving the feel of the history that I'm reading in a game format that tells the story faithfully, that doesn't trivialize the history, um, but really tells the story and makes both players feel like they lived a part of history. That's the big design challenge that uh, I'm working on right now. What games or styles of games do I like to play? Well, <laughs> I've been told that I'll play just about anything. Um, I, I have a lot of different interests. Um, I, I play, I play ASL. I really enjoy ASL. ASL is one of my, you know, top 10 games. Um, Probably never trade that away, you know what I'm saying? Um, I play X-Wing miniatures. Love that. I have tons of X-Wing miniatures. Love to play that. Um, I like to play Euro games. I like to play, especially Euro games that have like exploration in it. Um, I, I enjoy that. Um, I have a lot of different interests, guys. I, I, there's very little that I have that I'm unwilling to play. So let, let's put it that way. I, I think I moved beyond Settlers of Catan, but if there's a Catan game going on and they need another player, boom, I'm there. So there's very little that I, that I don't or won't play. How did I get into designing games? Well, um, I just, I don't know. It, it's kind of, kind of funny. I, I've been blessed to bump into the right people at the right times and, you know, one day I'm a play, I'm play testing a game. Next day, thing I know, I'm being asked to take over as developer. Uh, that was with Craig Besink's first game, Hellings, and then um, being able to you know meet the guys at GMT and um, be invited to work with with Mark Herman. And I mean, these are these are guys who you know I played their games, but now I get to work with them. That that's pretty cool. Uh, so how did I get into designing? Well, I think working in development, which just really kind of happened as a blessing. I, I was able to just connect with the right people at the right times, and boom, I'm in. And that kind of opened up the door for me to be able to dabble in design. I definitely know that, you know, experience in development helped me as a designer. Uh, helped me, helped me to have, you know, an open door to get a publisher to, you know, take a serious look at my game even though the very first iterations of Navajo Wars were pretty hideous and uh, just plain awful. Not not much fun at all. <laughs> it takes some time to get the game going in that one. Um, and I really appreciate their patience with me, but that's that's pretty much how I got designing. It just, it just kind of happened. Enemy instruction display. Now, this is the question I get all the time. How did you come up with this? Okay, now this is going to sound goofy, all right? Um... Well, first of all, if you don't know what I what it is I do, I'm I'm a pastor. I, I'm pastoring a church currently on the uh, Blackfeet Indian Reservation. I'm a man of God, and uh, well, I was having a real hard time getting Navajo Wars to be a game. My very first uh, prototypes of it were way too much simulation and way too little fun. Uh, they were they were simply brutal to play. They just weren't any fun. And I was pretty much ready to give up on the whole project, and I just felt like, you know, I needed to, I just needed to pray about this thing. And so I just asked God to give me an idea, um, you know, how, how to, how do I do this? I have an idea, but I don't know how to make it work. And literally, within the space of about a four hour period, I had this, just this idea just came to me. And it was for this, what you see here, the enemy instruction display. Now, it's gone through some refinement in Comancheria. In Navajo Wars, it's two columns and things can shift, you know, they can swap places like so uh, in Navajo Wars. So you have like this active column and a standby column and an inactive column. That's what you got there. Um But really, how did that come about? It was, I, I just believe it was an answer to prayer and... Got some inspiration, um, 
there's nothing else that I'd seen that's anything like it, but it works. It, it achieves the feel of a thinking opponent. There's, there's really no such thing as artificial intelligence. You, there's either intelligence or there's not. There's nothing artificial about it. So what I've basically done is I've created the illusion of a thinking opponent and this matrix system actually, uh, does that remarkably well and, uh, it's relatively simple to, uh, to handle. The hardest thing I found was writing the rules. How do I explain to players what I mean when I'm manipulating these counters? Coming up with the nomenclature was actually the hardest part. It went through a lot of different iterations before I could finally explain to players what it was that we were doing with this because no one had done it before. There's no frame of reference for it. Um, that's, that was probably the biggest challenge was, was figuring out how to tell people how this works. Uh, what is the most important thing when trying to win at Comancheria? Ah, there's so many things that can go terribly wrong for you. Um, watch this track. Watch these two here. Okay, your culture points get... Don't let your culture points get down. I mean, take a culture action, get it up, never lose opportunity to convert culture points into military points. Never take that for granted. Don't let the settlements get out of control. You can let tribes hang out. They're not going to, you know, they're, they're, a lot of them are going to go away on their own when it comes to disease and and those sorts of things. But don't let the settlements stack up on you. You let settlements stack up on you and then you get hit with a culture instruction and boom, you can lose the game so quickly. That I think that's the number one thing to watch out for. All right, last question. Uh, discuss how the game, you know, developed. Um, this game went through a number of prototypes before it came to be what you see here. Um, how do I explain this? The first prototypes were actually well received. I took them to a GMT weekend. I don't remember what year it was. 2012 or 13. It was in the spring. I remember that. And I, I, it was a card game. Initially, this was going to be a card game. I didn't want to do Navajo Wars Part 2. I wanted to do something completely different. I wanted to tell the story in a different way. And so I designed a card game. And the hostile tribes that you had to conquer, they were represented by, by cards, and the land was represented by cards and bison were cards. Everything was cards. And it worked, it worked surprisingly well. It's a very fun game. The problem was, at the same time I'm designing the game, I'm digging into the research. And this was a harder game to research than any of the other games I've designed, including Red Cloud's War. Red Cloud's War has probably been the easiest one to research because it's so well documented. Uh, Navajo Wars was easy to research because I lived among the Navajo at the time, and so it was very easy to get access to information. The Comanche was much more difficult because I didn't live anywhere near the Comanche Reservation, and the my access to materials was limited. But I came across the book Comanche Empires, and that turned out to be really the... If you read that book and you know this game, you will see how this game came about as a result of reading that book. But what happened was with the first prototype was it was a fun game, but it wasn't like anything that I'm reading in this book. And so that's where I had my problem. I had a, I had a good game with bad history. And I needed to do something about that. So um, I scrubbed the whole thing and went to a hybrid approach, which did use a map, but it also used cards to help build the map. And it was clumsy. I didn't like it. And so I threw that away, and I think I let the thing lie six months before I picked it up and started to uh, fiddle around with it again. Uh, and basically what I, I came back to was I came back to my roots. I said, okay, what, what if I took Navajo Wars and used it as my template? How would I do that for the Comanche? That was my starting point for what you see here. And so I thought, well, with Navajo Wars, there's the Canyon de Shea. Well, with the Comanche, it would be the Paladero Canyon. It's similar, but it should achieve a, a similar effect, but maybe less capable than the Canyon de Shea. I don't know, less of a trap. Um, so I started with that, and then I started to okay. Well, now we ha now we need to have territories, just like 
Navajo Wars. Well, let's have six territories and let's have six areas in each territory, just like Navajo War. And so that's what I began to do. And then I had to figure out, well, okay, now the enemy can come from four different directions. So I'm going to need to have some kind of mechanic for that. So Santa Fe in Navajo Wars is basically the equivalent to the square enemy spaces in this game. And so in the course of one afternoon, I drew this map and it I don't think it changed, but maybe a couple of line connections here and there. But for the most part, what you see here was something I sketched out in one afternoon. And throughout playtesting, it remained consistent. I just kind of added and tweaked a little here and a little there and made things kind of fit. And then I turned my attention to the enemy instruction display. And uh, I realized I needed four enemies. And I needed those enemies to act different in the four historic periods. And thus was born the history cards, and the rest kind of, <laughs> as they say, was history. One of the things I did set out to do is I wanted I wanted it easier for the player to understand if they were winning or losing and be able to see that at a glance. And so the victory check objectives, having that as a function on the history card was a very, very early design decision, and it, it really didn't change throughout development. Uh, the while in play effects were, were something that were added. Uh, the development cards were there at the very beginning. I wanted that something that would kind of flow out at you and just kind of move along, but I didn't want it to drive the game. I wanted it to supplement the game. So in that respect, it's very different from Navajo Wars. The culture is the last thing that we're added. This was very late in development. I felt like the game was good, but it was lacking a little flavor. Uh, it's like when you've cooked a stew or you've made a pot of chili. It's chili. It smells right but you taste it and it's like it's lacking depth and I really wanted something that would would give players the same level of experience that Navajo Wars did and I felt like this one was lacking a little bit in depth and so again I use Navajo Wars as my template well what am I missing that was in Navajo Wars and it was the whole culture and military points dynamic uh, that was something that was very late added to the game and concurrent with adding this was the addition of the culture cards and that was that's what really made the game pop it, it just really clicked from there so that's that, that's just a brief tour of Comancheria how it all came about I hope I haven't rambled too much hope you enjoyed this and uh, I'm Joel Toppin and thank you for watching thank you for listening and uh, you all have a great day I want to thank Joel very, very much for uh, being willing to do this video for us. Uh, if you want to show your appreciation to Joel for doing this, make sure you like the video and leave comments down below to show your appreciation. Uh, make sure you tune into all of our videos at the Board Game Network uh, and we may have some future designers discussing their games and how to win at their games or just some, you know, some fun little tidbits about how the game got developed. Uh, thank you, Joel. 